series. This is a series that we're now, I think, in our fourth or fifth week. We have about two more weeks left uh, of this Sawu Bona series, a series that is intended uh, to help us see the world through the eyes of our uh, black women and girls, primarily, uh, but certainly all of us, uh, I think, are resonating with the impact that this uh, series and these ideas have on us. Uh, the Sawu Bona series is intended to help us to uh, understand the burdens, the unique burdens that women, black women in particular, carry, and the unique ways that uh, men and our masculinity, and it is all often very much shaped by a toxic environment, thus creating toxic masculinity, the ways in which we all need to uh, figure out how we can be more... Um, more healthily in relationships one with another. And uh, I was uh, uh, very, very moved by a lot of the feedback that we're getting from our series. And, and for, for some, it's been a struggle. For others, it's been liber liberative. Uh, for other folks, the folks are confused, trying to figure out where do we go from here. So it makes me feel like this is a good series. Amen. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the possibilities. And we are in conversation uh, how do we continue to do what we've uh, been able to do with this series long beyond this uh, preaching and teaching series? I'm hoping that we will have a lot of opportunities to possibly have some monthly uh, groups and conversations that uh, allow folks to continue to dive deep in this series and in these ideas. Uh, I am actually uh, going to be uh, uh, talking with Brother Wayne and, and some of the men, because I think I want to uh, have a, a mandatory, and as much as you can make anything mandatory for folks these days, but a mandatory men's meeting uh, with all the men of the church, uh, so I can spend a couple hours with you all helping us to a little bit lean in and unpack why this is such an important topic for us uh, in this moment in time. Uh, I am... Mm -hmm. I am... Uh, I, I am, I am. of course, if y'all give me a few extra minutes, today's communion Sunday, so we're going to do communion and do a few things, so I'll try to preach a little shorter. Uh, but I, I, I am really uh, moved by um, the level of violence that uh, is, is, is erupting, uh, or at least has always been present and now kind of breaking uh, into the public space. Uh, for, for many of us, we've spent a lot of our time, I know, uh, our church has over the last several years, uh, focusing much of our attention on interpersonal gun violence in our neighborhoods, which deserves uh, the attention that it's gotten, and we will continue to focus on that violence, uh, the violence of guns and, and shootings and, and, and whatnot. Uh, but this series has really brought to life, to me, the kind of violence that women face regularly that is uh, often left unnamed. And uh, I do think that um, it's really important for all of us to appreciate um, that just like we say, if you're not a part of the solution as relates to gun violence or mass incarceration, if we're not a part of the solution actively of making sure violence against women uh, is reduced, if not altogether eliminated, um, then we're a part of the problem. And uh, since uh, the overwhelming majority of the Christian church in the world uh, are dark-skinned women, touch your neighbor somebody, and we are not able to um, adequately address the violence that is inflicted daily against their bodies and against their soul and against their families. Uh, I think our Christian faith uh, loses some of its credibility publicly if we can't figure out a better way to speak out and speak for healing and wholeness and peace. So um, I, I do hope uh, that as we move through these next couple days and we get this election out of the way, which hopefully will return folks to some semblance of sanity. Um, I wouldn't bet on it, but I guess we could, we could be prayerful and hopeful that we as the church can stand up in this moment with a greater social vision for what it means to live in community one with another. And uh, hopefully some of what we'll talk about today and what we've been talking about 
for the last month or so will help us be more positioned to do so. Turn with me then in your Bibles to Luke chapter number 10 uh, is where we'll spend our time today, and I, I'm sure it'll be on the screen. Luke chapter number 10, verse number 38. Uh, last week we preached on Lazarus, and we introduced Mary and Martha, uh, the sisters of Lazarus. That was in the book of John. This week we're going to stay with Mary and Martha. Uh, it's a different story of Jesus' engagement with Mary and Martha. So we're going to uh, take a look at this story uh, in uh, the book of Luke. Now, I think it's worthy of noting that uh, the book of Luke or the gospel according to Luke uh, was one of the most, uh, uh, um, it was one of the most uh, human gospels, if you will, uh, out of all of the gospels uh, because Luke was a physician. Uh, the author of the gospel, according to Luke, was a physician who uh, heard about uh, the ways of Jesus, was preached to, uh, many people believe, uh, by uh, Paul and, and uh, pulled together what he hoped would be, uh, in his own description, the most excellent account of the gospel of Jesus or of the story of Jesus. Uh, that is quite kind of putting a lot of pressure on yourself, amen, to let that be your introduction. Uh, I'm writing a book, and it will be the most excellent account. <laughs> While you got other, other books like Mark and Matthew running around, it's like, you know, my, my, my version going to be the bomb. I don't know what they, they was trying to do with theirs. No, um, but, but, but Luke was, was in many respects uh, taking... The, the oral traditions that fed into the book of Mark and the oral traditions that fed into the book of Matthew, the preaching of the early apostles in Jerusalem, and then the, the, the formation stories that were very pertinent for Paul. Luke took all of those and, and he pulled together an account of the gospel that had a part two, and that is the book of Acts. So if you go to Acts, uh, which is the book right after John, uh, which is the book right after Luke, touch your neighbor, amen, you'll see Luke acts as one continuous account of not just the gospel according to Jesus, the things that Jesus did, but also the actions of his followers after Jesus died and was crucified and was resurrected and ascended to heaven as our tradition and as the scriptures teach. Uh, why I think Luke is such an important part of the gospel story, as I stated, he was a physician, uh, so many of his particular stories uh, always kind of have a little bit of, a, of, a, of a, a, a medical kind of awareness. He focused a lot on diseases and a lot on the ways in which Jesus was there to impact the humanity of uh, those who Jesus interacted with. But Luke also uh, was one of the writers who elevated many of the encounters that Jesus had with women. And uh, that should not go unnoticed because, of course, the society of, uh, of the Romans and of particularly the, the, the ancient world in this time was a very patriarchal society, very much like the society we live in today where uh, maleness and, and, and uh, the, the roles of women were largely relegated uh, to places like property or without much agency. Uh, so the fact that Luke, as he was telling his story of the gospel of Jesus, would lift up these encounters with women and make them more than just commodify. The fact that Luke would show these women in partnership with Jesus or Luke would subvert some of the cultural uh, 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 reflexes that most women may uh, engage in, say when they are called in adultery or if uh, they were considered unclean because of their menstrual cycle or uh, if they uh, had uh, certain kinds of assumptions of how they spent their time or who would uh, be valuable uh, meeting at the tomb with Jesus was resurrected. Luke figured out a way to bring the women out from the background, which I think is another reason why for all of the challenges that Western Christianity has had in erasing and invisibilizing folk, you can see within some of our gospel narratives 
uh, the gesturing of the fullness of the human dignity of all people. And while it may not resonate as loud in the 21st century, uh, I want you to know that when folks were reading these texts back then, there was quite a bit of uh, subverting that was happening. Because, uh, you know, some of these women were to be unnamed and unseen. But some kind of way, Jesus interacted with them, and Luke caught those interactions and put them in a text to make sure that not all of the women in the world would be invisible. And I just want to keep reminding you that most of these women in the text were definitely uh, women of African and Middle Eastern descent. So uh, these are the kind of women we're trying to talk about today. Touch your neighbor, somebody. Here we go. Luke chapter number 10, verse 38. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what Jesus was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to Jesus and asked, Lord, do you not care that my lazy sister, oh, did I add lazy in there? I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself. That sounds like some sibling rivalry for you. Amen. I don't know. Tell, tell her then to help me. All right, Sister Martha. You telling Jesus, oh, give him all kind of commands. Uh, verse 41, but the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk uh, for the next few minutes uh, as we prepare ourselves for communion about let's be better. Let's be better. More specifically, let the healing begin. Let the healing begin. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me. And even the hearers of this word, in Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them let the healing begin. Amen. Give the other person a high five and tell them let's be better. Let's be better. Now, Jesus, when you really understand the radicality of his message, and his movement throughout a very fixed environment. Because the role of empire, let us always be reminded, is to control everything. The role of empire is to make sure our movements are done in a certain kind of way. Not movements like, you know, Black Lives Matter and the Dreamers. And I'm talking about like your physical movement. The role of empire is to make sure that your body is situated in a certain place and that a certain value is assigned. That's the role of empire. It is to determine existence. But then you have Jesus, you know, the one that was born to an unwed pregnant teenager. So that's already a problem, right? Because Jesus comes on the scene and he totally starts to destabilize that which has been controlled. Jesus comes in and his announcement when he comes, and we'll talk about this during the, 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 the uh, uh, what's the season coming up? Advent season. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about, about the way Jesus uh, messes up uh, our empire, if you will. But Jesus comes in and he, he pretty much starts to say, all right, he's announced as the Messiah. And he does things that make folk uncomfortable because people have certain assumptions about what a Messiah is supposed to look like, what a Messiah is supposed to do. And the reason why Jesus ended up on a cross is because his version of Messiah made everybody uncomfortable, even those who were oppressed. <laughs> Woo, Jesus, help me today. I mean, it, it, it just goes to show you 
that for all of us who claim to want liberation, we don't want it that bad. Lord, I feel like preaching already. We're at a Mac. Get on that organ. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> so Jesus comes and he upsets the status quo. And what's so important, I think, for me and us in, in, this, in this moment as we are obviously seeing what's happening with the elections and the narratives and our relationships is that if we do not continue to push ourselves beyond our comfort zones, we may become an agent of the status quo. And when you and I become agents of the status quo, we can get used to our own misery as well as the misery of others. And then start to make excuses. Like the poor will be with us always. Right? Now I don't think Jesus when he said that was, was, was trying to tell the disciples. So don't, don't try to end poverty. I think you know Jesus is trying to say. So if the poor are going to be with you always. You need to be with the poor. <laughs> as well. <laughs> so when we take a look then at the status quo of how certain people's lives are, 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 are situated, it, it makes, it, at least it, it should make us all ask different questions about what then are we called to do and be if we're following Jesus, not as, um, you know, people engaging in a multiple choice example. Right, where I get to pick what I want to follow. So it's easy for me as a male, black, heterosexual preacher, and I could American, I could put all other kind of McBride, 49er fan. Now that the Warriors winning, a Warrior fan. <laughs> the Lakers beat the Warriors, so I'm back a Laker fan. Touch up, no, I'm just kidding. The Raiders are winning, a Raider fan, right? We have all these different kinds of ways I could describe myself. But the truth of the matter is, the moment I start to describe myself, those descriptions are always over and against someone else. Now, the danger of those descriptions uh, can certainly mean that I can essentialize people in ways that are, are always problematic. Because how many of you know uh, people are always much more complex than any description you will give them? Right? Uh, but the descriptions are important and helpful because they can also name the kinds of realities that may get us closer to disrupting the status quo. And see, when we talk about the burden that black women carry, I hope it's not lost upon us that this indeed is something that con con should concern all of us because it's not just this academic exercise, but there are life and death implications to us helping to alleviate the burdens that our sisters are carrying or create an environment where that burden remains. If you've read this text that we're building our, our series from, uh, the, the theologian I went to Duke with her, Shanique, Dr. Shanika Walker-Barnes, she lays out in extensive detail, and I commissioned this book to all of you, uh, um, Too Heavy a Yoke. I hope you're, you're, you're engaging with this book. But she lays out, and there's another wonderful sister, uh, Emily Towns, who talked about this book called, she wrote this book called Breaking the Fine Rain of Death, which was actually the book that transformed my whole thinking around the healthcare industry and system back when I was in seminary. Um, understanding that health is important. Our health is important. Your health is important. So if we're reading the book of Luke, Luke who was a physician, 
And we're seeing the ways in which Jesus was able, through the physician's eyes, to touch and heal folks, regardless of all their manner of illnesses and diseases, as he also secured their soul salvation. I hope it's not lost on us, as Dr. Shaniqua says, that obesity, diabetes, cancer, HIV, AIDS, stress, depression, violence, physical and sexual assaults are all forms of violence visited upon the health of women in this congregation. Folk you sit next to today have been all week assaulted by some of these things that I've said. And so the question for all of us, not just black women or black men or white men or white women or Latino women or Latino men or Asian men or Asian women or, or, or whatever category I didn't name, that if the scripture is true that it says we must rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, carry the burdens of one another in mutuality, then the burden that is being carried must then become our burden to solve. So the question then is, how do we solve these burdens? Or at least relieve these burdens? Now, one way some folks solve them is that we put on a mask and act like we don't have no problems. Mm-hmm. Masks are a result of the lie that tell you and I we are not enough. A mask is something you put on to perform, to hopefully present yourself as something you are not or hide your true self from someone you don't want to know who you are. But when you and I follow Jesus, how many of you know Jesus can see right through your mask? I mean, that's, a, that's the risky thing about following Jesus. Like, you can have on a mask and think you hide, and Jesus be like, McBride. Uh. And keep it real, if, you, if someone knows you well enough, they can, they can see past your mask too. Where I was growing up, and you know, I we do all these go hide to go seats and dress up and all this kind of stuff, and you try to you know uh, go 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 trick somebody, and they just be like, "Hey, Michael, like what 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 what's wrong?" He's like, "How'd you know it was me?" <laughs> There's more to you than that mask that gives you away. So could it be that a mask only is effective when you are around people you are not? intimate with. And so could the challenge be for the church, right, is that we must be willing to move past the kind of light interaction that is often based out of tolerance <laughs> into something that's a little bit more risky. Oh, tell your neighbor, that's a challenge, Pastor Mike, amen, because I don't like a whole lot of people now. Let's be clear. <laughs> and, and, and how many of you know, depending on your personality type, right, because some of us are, in, now, you know, people, don't, people don't, don't believe me, but I am naturally an introvert. I, if you, if, <laughs> if you, if you, t when I take my personality type, I, I am an introvert. Uh, but I have had to learn over the last 20 years how to move past my natural inclination so I can accomplish this assignment that God put in my life. Now, be clear. If I had my druthers... I'd be on a rock somewhere reading a book, studying and praying, and not dealing with none, y'all. <laughs> not because y'all not great people, praise God. But my personality type, it draws energy. And I, don't, I just be tired. I'd be like, Lord, if I, 
If I could just be in my bed and read a book and watch Game of Thrones or Walking Dead or something, something barbaric. I'd be, if I had to talk to half these folk around here, I'd just be okay. Anybody like that? Hey Amen. You feel like, all right. Now, some of y'all not introverts, though. Y'all just antisocial, praise God. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I'm clear that in order for us to not be overdetermined by these masks, you and I have to be in deeper relationship across difference. Right? Across all these socialized categories that overdetermine our lives more than the gospel. Now, if we follow Jesus well, then I think you and I have to look for some different models. And, and that's why communion and the Eucharist that we'll do later is going to be such an important practice. Because it gives you and I some practices that are somewhat different. We come and we eat of the bread and drink of the wine and we do that together. Why? Because most of these folk in here, you wouldn't eat with or drink with any other time. Because like I said, we overdetermined by difference. Some of us, if we saw each other walking down the street, we sure enough wouldn't speak. Amen. Amen. We wouldn't make eye contact. We, we clutch our purses. Some of us will cross, cross the other side. Some of us will mean mug you and be like, don't you say a word to me. <laughs> right? Hello, somebody. Because we've been overdetermined. We've been taught to think some folk are a threat. Our experience has reinforced that, unfortunately, too often. So the fact that we have a pretty multiracial, multi-class, different level of education, most of us are, are, are you know, uh, uh, following Jesus or, or at least trying to figure this Jesus thing out. Because remember, Jesus is radical and we ain't radical. So we trying to figure it out. This is the gift of the gospel in a world overdetermined by isolation. Now, part of what I want to submit to you as we go through the last few weeks of this series is what does it mean to lean into the disruption of the status quo that would maintain the unhealthy outcomes for many folk in this room? Make sure, number one, that I'm not contributing to that. Intentionally or unintentionally. That I am actively making sure that these sisters in my life don't view me as a burden. That I'm not helping them put on their armor of strength and protection and silence and carrying burdens that God did not intend them to carry. But that when they get around me, I can actually be someone that could help change those conditions. Both men, women, all of us, loved ones, how do we make people's lives less unhealthy? Because when you run into Jesus, it seems to me, now of course, you know, the text is written, uh, and they, 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 they wrote this text by the leading of the Spirit of God to give a detailed and convincing proof of who Jesus was and what Jesus did. But when you run into the Jesus encounters, no matter who you were, everybody seemed to have left Jesus' presence better than they were before they encountered Jesus. Now, that's quite a litmus test for the follower of Jesus, right? Because if Jesus, the one who is the holiest, most perfect, loving, healing individual ever walked the face of the earth can be next to prostitutes, murderers, thieves, liars, haters, and they all leave Jesus like, wow, that was 
That was kind of all right. What to say about us that when we get done talking, folks, folks just be a nervous wreck. They just shaking like, oh, man, these church people. If I never got to deal with another church person again, my life will be blessed. Hello, somebody. It is a litmus test. It is indeed something so important. And I think that I am asking you and I to examine what are the masks then we must be willing to let go of for the liberation of all peoples. And how can we, even in these next few weeks, imagine is there a way this can happen, particularly by experiencing the masks that our black women carry? Paul Lawrence Dunbar, thank God for Sister Sharia, who has been helping to pull a lot of our material for this series together. Amen. We thank God for her. Thank God for her. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, this part of our series uh, text, uh, he has a, 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 a poem that is worthy, I think, to lift up. We, mer- we wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human gal when torn and bleeding hearts, I'm sorry, with torn and bleeding hearts, we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but O oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but O oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream. Otherwise, we wear the mask. And so part of what I want to help us imagine for this particular text we've lifted up is if it is indeed the case that it is the responsibility, if I just pull this last little piece out, that the world should dream, meaning They may have their own sense of who we are. And they may have an imagination that is too limited to express the fullness of who we are. But if you and I can recover the idea, the imagination of God that created us with all our complexities and all our challenges and remove this kind of litmus test that is often overdetermined by Western ideals and say, God, I want to be who you've called me to be, regardless of the labels and regardless of the definitions. I want to be healthy. I want to be whole. I want to be better. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him we better get better now. Because if we don't get better, How many of you know worse is always a possibility? Lord, help me today. And and if we got all these problems already happening in the world, I don't have any more margin for worse. And neither does your brother, your sister, your family member sitting next to you. We must be better. And part of what it means to be better is we have to facilitate healing. Jesus interacting with his friends. Again, this idea that Jesus is showing up in the text to the home of two sisters is subversive in and of itself. Because in ancient culture, men didn't just show up to women's houses. Mm -hmm. Wasn't this thing like, you know, we're going to have platonic cross-gender friend relationships. No, no, it was a scandalous kind of thing. And some folks would even read into the text and say that this is further evidence that Jesus was in some type of relationship with Mary and they ended up being married. Uh, But I just want to say that that ain't in Christian tradition and it don't seem to be affirmed by Scripture. So uh, I just let all the folk on the History Channel continue to pontificate. Uh, because just because you can't imagine something don't mean that it did not happen. Or none of us would be saved. How about that? Amen. Uh Uh-huh. Because a lot of folk can't imagine you even worthy of salvation. 
worthy of redemption. They think you just a piece of work and you was born a piece of work and you're going to die a piece of work. But how many of you know God don't see you through the eyes of the limited imagination of people? We are who God says we are. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell him I'm going to get better today. Part of what it means then is for you and I to decolonize our Christian faith and pull apart some of these things that make it easier for us to sustain an environment of suffering. When we read the text, it's so important to appreciate that Jesus interacting with these women and his disciples is a subversive act. It is an act that begins to reorder not only relationships but society. It begins to help folk appreciate and realize that when you are living out your call, you are often going to be put in places that make you uncomfortable because things around you make it so that you are comfortable being in that box. Mm -hmm. And some of us have to be willing to get out of that box. Some of us have to be willing to expand that box. Some of us got to be willing to cut open some doors in that box so more folk can be free from that box. Because what does it, what sense does it make for you to be free and you leave everybody else in bondage? I'm here to tell you, some of us got to make sure that while we are getting free, we're going to make sure the conditions for our loved ones is freedom as well. Jesus interacting with Mary and Martha, it is very clear that when Jesus shows up, there's all kind of things that get triggered. The scripture says in verse number 38 and 40, as we've read, that Jesus shows up into the village and they go to the home of Martha and Mary. And immediately, Mary plops down in front of Jesus and they start hanging out. And Martha is... Uh, 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 obsessed with certain kinds of tasks. And I think the first thing that is worthy of our consideration, if we are going to allow the healing to begin, first thing, we must avoid busyness. Verse number 40, but Martha was distracted by her many tasks. Now, I'm going to mess up a few of us because uh, when I read this in the message version, it said that she was in the kitchen. Now, what's so interesting about that is I looked in the in the original Greek, uh, and only because I, I, you know, I've been, you know, getting getting uh, blessed, amen, blessed by a lot of my feminist womenist friends who talk about the kitchen and all these different kind of ways that over determines female uh, uh, femininity identity and whatnot. And and don't get me wrong, now, amen, because I, I I thank God that some of y'all know how to do that kitchen thing, amen, and I thank God that the, some of the brothers do too, amen. But how many know there's more to the sisters than the kitchen? Mm -hmm. So when you read the text, and some of us, I grew up automatically thinking Martha was in the kitchen, but when you read the original Greek, the word there is diakonuk, diakonis, diakonis, which in the Greek is actually a word used for deacons. It is a word that denotes ministry, like a formal ministry position, which makes me ask a different set of questions about what Martha was doing. Because maybe Martha was not necessarily doing anything in the kitchen. Maybe Martha was doing some good old blessed work. But yet Martha still found herself too busy to appreciate that healing had walked into her house. So could it be that you and I can be busy, too busy doing both the right or the wrong thing, and miss out on an opportunity to experience the presence of God in our lives? If we're going to get better, we got to stop being so busy. You too busy to go to a 90-minute live group. I'm too busy to take my girls to the park. You too busy to go to dinner and go get some counseling. You too busy to learn about your own historical trauma. 
Why? Because often being busy is the medicine. It is how we self-medicate. I don't want to mess up too many folk. Amen. Because my time is leaving me quickly. I know some of y'all like, let the clock go faster, Pastor Mike. But you ought to tell your neighbor, don't be so busy you can't heal. Don't be so busy you can't heal. Busyness can be a curse. And how many know living in the Bay Area, that is probably the greatest curse of this region? Mm -hmm. Is that we feel like we have to work every day, every moment, every second, just to make ends meet. Why? Because there's somebody else behind us who's willing to do that to get our position in order to make your ends meet. But how many of you know God has a different kind of rhythm of life? That we must be invited, realize we are invited into, and by faith, we must walk in that way. Why? Because in the rhythm of life of Jesus, the burden is light. My sisters, the burden is light. Tur, when you adjust your rhythm. To the rhythm of Jesus. What was Jesus' rhythm? Well, you see Jesus throughout the Gospels engaging with folks and then withdrawing from the crowds. Meaning like Jesus had, I had enough of y'all. I love y'all. <laughs> y'all are wonderful people, but I got to go. <laughs> and there's some folk who wouldn't let Jesus go. So you know what? The scripture says Jesus would just walk through them. I don't know what that means. But I'd be wishing I had that power sometimes. Just, just walk right through you. Jesus would heal folk, and then sometimes Jesus would go to the mountain to pray. Jesus had his 12 disciples, and then he had three that he would hang out with. Jesus wasn't just the same in his relationships and existence all the time. Jesus had to recalibrate himself based on his need of balance and self-care. And I want to submit to you today that busyness gets in the way of self-care. So the way you and I get well and better is to commit ourselves to self-care. If you and I are too busy at church, at home, on our job, in the community, doing revolutionary work, doing unrevolutionary or non-revolutionary work, if you're too busy that you can't take care of yourself, then you're not getting better. You are increasing the capacity for you to be worse. And I want to really invite all of us to appreciate what kind of community we could have if all of us made time for self-care? I could probably have more capacity to love you if I took better care of myself. I may have a longer fuse, so I won't go off on you if I took better care of myself. My loved one, my partner, my kids, if I wasn't looking at them as the object of all of my frustration, and disappointment with God or with my circumstance, I could probably be a better father and mother and auntie and uncle and brother and sister if I took better care of myself. And understand the busyness of Martha was not necessarily a negative set of tasks. That's why I want to bring out with the, with the, the, the transliteration of the Greek, I want to submit and lift up that she was distracted by her busyness. And distraction can be a drug if you let it. The scripture says we should be sober-minded. God has not given a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. That God will fulfill his purpose. A purpose has a point, a telos, a trajectory, an end. And when we get too distracted, we can end up in the wrong place, even if we're doing the right thing. So what is the question you are to wrestle with today for this first point? Well, 
How is your busyness keeping you from self-care? And it is an act of faith, because think about this. There are a lot of people Jesus did not heal. So you got to think, what, what did that do to Jesus? That he didn't have time to heal everybody because he was too tired. The people made him had enough. I got to go. Got to go talk to God, on the, talk to my father on the mountain. There was people still sick in the valley. But Jesus prioritized self-care. So that left some needs undone. But could it be that it is not up to you as a human being to solve every problem? How do you know that's the height of arrogance? That, oh, if I was just there, if I was just in the room, if I just talked to them, if I just did this, the whole thing, that's, I'm like that. I get mad when I be left out of certain conversations, especially when the thing just spin off in it. I, look at that. See, <laughs> if, if I was there, I'd have grabbed that comment by the tail and flung it back to the earth. <laughs> As if God wasn't there. <laughs> Hello, somebody. I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I had to be there. No, you didn't have to be there. You wanted to be there. I mean, I, I miss flights because I, I, I fly so much, and it, it, the hardest act of me flying is getting out of my house to the airport because I have a mental exhaustion with driving to the airport to leave my family. It is exhausting. Once I'm on a plane, I sleep on the plane three hours, get up, do what I got to do, and come back home. But leaving... So when I miss flights, I'd be feeling so bad because, you know, my flight leave at 1040 and I leave at 10 o'clock. <laughs> Get out the way, you know. But someone told me, you know, is, if you missed a flight, you probably wasn't supposed to be on that flight. Oh, no, but what about what I was supposed to do? Well, if you, if you wasn't on a flight, you just wasn't on a flight. You ain't Superman. How you going to get there? And every conversation I've missed because I wasn't on the flight, guess what? The conversation still happened. The world didn't fall apart. And I got a few more extra hours with my family. Busyness is the enemy of self-care. If we are going to let go of these burdens, we must let go of busyness. Whether it's busyness caused by the church, your ministry, your career, your job, busyness must be a casualty for those committed to self-care. Man, I, 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 I got a lot more to go, but I think I just need to stop right there. Because I do believe that some of us need to ask God to help us Slow down. So we can think and reflect on the conditions that we are in. Martha, she wasn't doing, she wasn't in there like, you know, messing up nobody. She was doing something that had value. But it was robbing Martha of the opportunity to be in community with her sister, Jesus, and all those disciples. It was robbing her of the opportunity to sit at the feet of the one who could bring healing. And it certainly was robbing her of the ability to, or it was certainly creating the condition for her to feel isolated. And I just got to believe that when you're around healthier people, some folk who got good boundaries not going to run the rat race with you. <laughs> no, you've got to, you, I, I, I can't do that. Hello, somebody. We can isolate ourselves by just being too busy. In your family, in your relationships, what does it mean to slow down and wrestle with the complexity 
Next week, we're going to spend a little bit more time unpacking some of these other pieces. So we're going to be in Mary and Martha next week because I, I, I want to I want to I want to lean in to this next point that 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 talks a little bit about how Martha spoke up. Well, if y'all give me like five more minutes, I can talk about that right now because I. <laughs> All right, just, just 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 a preview. Even though Martha was busy, Martha still spoke up. Jesus, why I'm all out here by myself? Martha, Mary in there playing with, around with you, John and James and Peter and the rest of the boys. What's up with that? Martha did not swallow her concerns. And this is one of the great challenges that our sisters face is we often ask them to just swallow it. And I talk about brothers, we often be asked to swallow our concerns too. Especially if we pain in pain or you're trying to emote. I went and saw Moonlight this weekend, me and Sharice. And it was a it was a very fascinating expression of masculinity. And uh it was deep because you know they 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 it was it was about a, a young African American boys, it was actually a film about boys, particularly one boy who who uh Wrestling with his sexuality, obviously, and um, had a had a, a encounter with another boy who obviously gay, and at least it, it seemed that way. But all of the different complexities of these young black boys being called names and being beat up and. It, 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 it made me sit there and think about how complex our lives are and that our struggles can often be so threatening to others that they will make us feel like we have to swallow our struggle. But ain't it something that Jesus was not insecure about Martha's I mean, I joked about it, like Martha telling Jesus, why don't you tell Mary to get on out here and do what Mary's supposed to do? <laughs> Jesus didn't strike her down. How dare you, lightning? Where's my lightning at? <laughs> so what kind of conditions must we create where people feel like they can speak up when the conditions are oppressing them. If no other place, I think the church should be that kind of place where I'm not on such a high horse <clears throat> that dissent, like it is in the world, is criminalized. You know, you dissent in the world. One of our good friends, they was breaking up the homeless camp here in Berkeley, so some of the folks went out there to try to, I guess, intervene and they arrested one of our good friends, Sister Nancy, who's running for city council. Took her to Santa Rita, had her in there for almost 18 hours. Now I just saying to myself, now it ain't like you was out here, you know, selling, dealing drugs, shooting nobody, hurting nobody. You trying to help the homeless folk. Admittedly, the police probably gave you a command and you did not comply. But what does it mean that we created such an environment where dissent can trigger violence on the dissenter. May we not be that in the church, at least this church. I can't control, I barely can control this church, but just y'all work with me. <laughs> Give your neighbor a high five, tell them, let's work with, let's work, let's work together to not create an environment where disagreement creates violence. Because we can disagree and still be nonviolent with each other, still love one another, still exist together, still strive for the unity of the faith as Jesus and the scriptures tell us to. I love that Martha was able to talk back to Jesus. And Jesus was able to give Martha an answer that proved to be not only liberative for Martha, but hopefully liberative for us. Stay with me, everybody. Let's take a few moments. 